good day uh, or good night, wherever they are, wherever you are. My name is Naylin Reyes. I thank you very much for the opportunity of talking to you today. I'm speaking to you from um, the Northern Territory, from Australia, but these are the traditional lands of the Larakia First Nation um, Aboriginal people. Hence, I would like to start uh, paying my respects to all the elders, past, past, present and emerging, and recognizing the fact that we are living in their lands, traditional lands. So today I'm speaking to you about this very rare case um, that we faced here in a very, very remote area in Australia. Uh, the topic of my presentation is sphenopalatine artery ligation for a life-threatening epistaxis in a four-year-old child with Glassman's thrombastinia. Of course, I'm going to explain to you what's this because it's a very rare disorder. So uh, we have granted the ethics approval for this project and uh, the consent given by the patient, of course. There are no conflicts to declare, no founding, and my team is composed by several other members, uh, Dr. Nela Modi, uh, Dr. Akash Carlo, and Dr. Hemi Patel. It's a multidisciplinary team. Australia, if you have had the opportunity to come here to Australia, or even if you have not, and eventually after COVID is finished, I would like you to visit here. It's beautiful. At the Northern Territory, it's particularly large, sparsely populated area where um, we have more or less 246, 500 population in which a third of them are indigenous and another third, it's actually a multicultural society. So we have people from all over the world, which makes very unique, um, particular type of population in the Northern Territory in Australia. The fact that we live in a very sparse, uh, large area, sparsely populated, makes things a little bit challenging because one, we have a multicultural society with very few, um, very few amount of um, health systems available. So we have only one hospital in the Northern Territory, which covers the whole vast area. As a background, I can uh, tell you Glassman thrombastinia, it's a very rare autosomal recessive platelet disorder. It affects the chromosome number 17. The underlying defect lies in the altered quality and quantity of the glycoprotein 2P3A receptor complex, also called integrin B beta 3. So that's a unique part of the platelet that although our patients have normal platelet count, the platelets are dysfunction and they do not work. In our case study, uh, we assess a four-year-old uh, Filipino girl, and this girl um, has been uh, presenting to the emergency department for several times. From the age of one, she was diagnosed with Glanzman thrombastinia. Interestingly, there's no family history of any blood disorders. She presented to the emergency clinic to, uh, with an acute shock syndrome, you know, losing a lot of blood, hypotensive, tachycardic. Unfortunately, because of many presentations in the emergency department, she has developed a very rare condition, which is a uh, class one and two human leukocyte antigen antibodies, which means that this girl cannot receive any platelet transfusions, which makes things very complicated with her because she cannot receive anything extra support. So her clinical presentation yeah. had, so her clinical presentation that needed several um, background and several management, including subsequent admissions with recombinant factor number seven, which uh, commercially we can find as not or seven, uh, and in a dose of 90 milligrams per kilo repeti repetitively. E this girl presented first in 
with a massive epistaxis. On examination, I could see that she had a large clotted neuropharynx surrounded by bright active ooze. So she was actively bleeding despite the fact that she already had a clot. She was initially packed with a Merosel pack, which is a synthetic favorite type of a, a packing nose pack, uh, also with tranexamic acid, and that did not control her case. A multidisciplinary approach was needed in her case. So given the recurrent nature and severity of her latest presentation, uh, we need the input from hematology, ICU, pediatrics, general surgery, and of course, ENT. We started her management with an ALS protocol, as usual, with double lines, uh, fluid resuscitation, uh, IV transfusion, blood transfusions, and the use of Nova 7 recombinant factor. Despite this medical management, epistaxis did not abate. So we seek the advice from the hematology team in our unit who suggested the use of constant tranexamic acid and constant Novo 7, uh, two milligrams IV infusion. Following consideration, because we could not find any medical treatment to treat her, we ran several pediatric centers and we decided to go ahead with an exploration and potential um, endoscopic ligation of her spinopalatine artery. So what we can see here in this uh, illustration is her sphenopalatine artery. Now, in this particular case, we all are familiar with the sphenopalatine artery ligation. However, this was a four-year-old girl uh, without any background of any surgeries before. We know that the knowledge of anatomy in kids is particularly important of the uh, sinus, uh, paranasal sinus, because we need to prevent any deformity while growing. The bony etmoidal crest is exposed just anteriorly to the sphenopalatine foramen, uh, where the crystal was identified. So that makes things a little bit more complicated than in an adult. Preoperative consent in these patients is very important. So whenever you uh, are organizing this type of special cases, be very open with the consent making, the procedure of a failure, the procedure of needing to go ahead with an angioembolization with interventional radiology, and the fact that this could potentially affect the growth process in the uh, sphenoid sinus and etmoidal sinus, it's very important as well. The surgical management uh, was performed with a mini invasive endoscopic sinus surgery followed um, to avoid unnecessary scarring, as I was saying. A vertical incision is made inferior to the posterior portion of the middle turbinate, one centimeter anterior to the posterior tip. A fryer dissection is used to rise a mucoperiosteal flap posteriorly and upward. The access to this area was very limited because she was a very tiny girl. Uh, so the ostium of the maxillary sinus was widened backward to the outline of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. In addition, as part of the management, part of the care of the dental roots was very important and we had to be very careful with the lamina papyracea and the orbit. The artery was identified as you can see in this beautiful picture. And, and it was both ligated and cauterized with a special bipolar tool. Extreme attention to the uh, cauterization of the pediatric uh, group needs to be done, knowing um, that we need to be very delicate with the skin around the uh, nose or the nasal septum after cauterization. As part of our follow-up was, um, we, I divided this follow-up in immediate, short-term and long-term. So immediate management with this um, beautiful girl was once the sphenopalatine artery was, was identified, ligated, and bipolarized, we applied the top of it a little bit of purostat. So purostat is a synthetic hemostatic material uh, and it has peptides that help to shape a memory on the enabled tissue and it mimics uh, extracellular matrix, human extracellular matrix. Additionally, a marrow cell pack was introduced in the area of interest to compress and apply a little bit of extra pressure in that area. After that, um, a little bit of um, saline water was used in order to apply more compression. Now the short-term and mid-term management consisted in avoiding the formation of granulation 
and additions that could potentially stop or impair hair growth. So we have, have recommended polymicord respials. This is a constant practic practice in Australia and UK. So we use flow sinus rings and res uh, polymicord respials, 0 0.25 milligrams per two milliliters. We dilute everything and wash the sinuses twice a day. The long-term follow-up included three monthly follow-ups with intermittent nasal endoscopies. Then eventually we um, made it a little bit longer. So far, it has been four years since she had this intervention. And thankfully, she hasn't had any more bleed since then. As a discussion, I would like to raise the fact that epistaxis may be the first sign and the first clinical manifestation of a rare hematological disorder in children. So we all know that children have epistaxis, but if this is recurrent, this may be a trigger of a red flag for further investigations. Epistaxis is one of the most common manifestations in patients with Glassman thrombastinia, as high as 73%. Surgical management has been unfortunately not being published because it's very rare. So far, there's another uh, article in the article that I just published explaining the need of uh, and the safety of sphenopalatine artery ligation in very severe or life-threatening nosebleeds in children. Performing an emergency surgery in an unstable child with ongoing bleeding can be very challenging. Hence, the perioperative optimization is vital. And this leads me to my second point. The use of a multidisciplinary team, it's very important. So use your team around, use hematology, use ICU, pediatrics, gen surge, to guarantee that you are offering a holistic care to these patients. This is in particular importance in sinonasal surgery as clear endoscopic visualization is partial, partially achieved when we have a hypotensive bradycardic child. The limitations of my study is the fact that this is only a case report. So more research is needed. Because of the rarity of this situation in this condition, we, I, encourage you, if you face a situation similar to this one, it would be fantastic to know your ideas, your management, what did you do? Because we need more publications and we need more publications regarding the differences in anatomy in children versus adults. The management, if it needs to be less aggressive or more aggressive in children versus adults. As a conclusion, endoscopic Sphenopalatine artery ligation in Klasman thrombastinian children with intractable epistaxis is safe, and so far it has shown to be an effective, an effective procedure. However, an adequate perioperative optimization and a multidisciplinary approach is definitely paramount. It's essential. I do want to thank you all for this opportunity. This is my email address. Please feel free to give me a ring or to write to me at any time. I would be very happy to hear your thoughts and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much for your attention.